First of all, I want to give you an idea about the duty a night watchman had back in the old days. Their main job was to guard the city at night. They were out in the streets like the police, taking care of the city when all the others were sleeping. And sure, that was dangerous, because all the good people were at home. <laughs> Those who were still out in the streets were the drunken folks and thieves, maybe even enemies. That's why it was dangerous. And that watchman had to carry this kind of weapon. It's called a hell bar. One can do a lot of things with it. <laughs> it's for multiple use. And there were six of us, six night watchmen. Each had to guard his own district. Now it's just me left. Thank God. <laughs> Another duty that watchman had, that's why they got the horn, was to give a loud signal when there was a fire at night. Do you want to hear it? Yes. But do you see any fire? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's small, but it counts. It was like that. Yeah. to make everybody wake up who was close enough. And all the people who heard the signal ran out of their houses, trying to fight the fire as quick as possible. It was the biggest fear people had. Nothing worse could ever happen to a city in the old days but a fire at night. It was surely good to know somebody's out there not watchman's on duty. His quick alarm could save people's lives, could save the whole city. That sounds like it was an important profession, doesn't it? And it's true. <laughs> it was important, but at the same time, it was considered a low profession because people were superstitious. Back in the Middle Ages, they feared the night in the darkness. People believed in all kinds of spooky things going on at night. And night watchman was with all this. And that's why it was considered a low profession. I know it's not logical for us now, but it was for people back then. For them. That all made sense. By the way, guess who were the two lowest professions? Psst. <laughs> who was on the very bottom of the social scale? Executioner. That's right. The executioner. The hangman was the lowest. And the second lowest was the grave digger. And they like to work together, these two. <laughs> they had the same clients <laughs> with a short time difference. The third lowest was already me, that watchman and tower. And not to forget two more things. They were also lamp lighters. They lightened street lamps in the evening when it went dark. And they had to check if the doors of their houses were all locked. That's what a night watchman did all over Europe, in all the cities, like here. And we had them here until 1920, quite a long time. The real night watchman existed in Rome. Doesn't mean I'm not real. It's my main job for many years, and everything's better now, I admit. Work time is much less. 
not all nice, and pays bitter too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> and it's not dangerous at all like it once was, because you all come with me now. So I feel pretty safe tonight <laughs> with all of you people. And after this intro, it's almost time to leave. Just one last remark. You know, there's a lot of history coming up in this hour about Rodenburg and the Middle Ages. You can never, ever keep all this in mind. And why should you? I put it on a DVD. <laughs> <laughs> I narrated it. <laughs> it's playing an hour 15 plus a bonus track. <laughs> it's the American system. <laughs> and it's way more than the tour. It's like the extended tour. With all the details, live action, archive material, the right music. <laughs> it's like watching History Channel, starring me. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know. It's available at the end for 15 euros. And now I'm going to put it begin. Are you ready to go? <laughs> then let's go. Square is surrounded by a lot of big houses. Some of them are from the 14th century. The huge building right opposite. On the other side of the street, it's our town hall. An impressive building. And have you seen St. Jacob's Church by Chile? It's more a cathedral than a church. All this talk means this was a rich and all the buildings that are mentioned still show the Welt Rotenburg once hand. And there were three reasons why this was a rich place. Our main economy was our territory. There were 400 square kilometers of fertile land, 180 villages. All this land, this all belonged to Rotenburg a wide territory with all kinds of food. And almost every year, there was a surplus of grain, wool, wine, that we could export because it was more than we needed for our own people. Reason number two were two important trade routes, and Rodenburg was right next to them. One was coming from Prague to Paris. East West, and the other one from Scandinavia down to Rome, Italy, North, South. Nowadays, that's the Autobahn A6 <laughs> and A7, intersection about 20 miles west from here. But back in the old days, when they got the tree, this intersection was just 300 yards outside of our main gate. And sure, that was perfect because a lot of merchants, pilgrims, travelers, being that close, dropped in, spending time and money in our city. Like now. <laughs> you. And not to forget the third reason, Rodenburg had a special status. It was a free imperial city. From 1274, when we got this privilege, which was, by the way, the highest privilege a king could ever give to us, until 1802, when we lost because we became part of the period. In all the centuries in between, this was a state in a state with its own city government. No duke or bishop above, just the king himself. 
but the empire was big and the king was strong. So we could do our own thing. And Nuremberg became an important place, politically and economically. There were 6,000 inhabitants in the 15th century. At this time, this was one of the 20 biggest cities in the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. And we had a time of glory from 14th to 17th century. But then, all of a sudden, everything stopped. And this city fell asleep for 250 years. Time still stayed. Nothing happened anymore. There was just poverty. Things were very extreme. In our history, it really went up and down. But I'll tell you later about the down. It's too early for the sad story. We are here in the main street of Rodenburg. This is the widest lane in town. When you look back, you can see it. Lots of big houses right and left. The rich and noble people like to live here, in that street and around the market square. We were called patricians, the rich and noble family and the biggest privately owned building in the whole city. It's right opposite. It's that green one there. And there's something special. Next to the entrance, there are these chains with a handle. See them? These were the doorbells, like people used to have them long ago. If one pulls there, the bells inside ring. But not anymore. Because everybody tries. <laughs> <laughs> and the people who live there, they don't like them. <laughs> they fix them. Interesting detail is, those who own the house and live in some are descendants of the noble family, which moved in more than 300 years ago, in 1660. And they're still in there. <laughs> Not the same people, but the same family, which is really amazing, mm -hmm. even here. And there's something else very typical, very obvious. All the big houses have it, like they have it. I mean the wide gate. It had to be so wide that a carriage could drive into the courtyard. Imagine a big courtyard behind a big house. People got a barn and a stable there. Animals and vegetables. A city in the old days was like a big village. Sure, it didn't look like one. It was much bigger walled and fortified. But it smelled like one. <laughs> and even worse, because there was a tannery and a skinnery the stench coming from there was really outstanding. <laughs> and the streets were out of dirt, no cobblestones. The animals were in the streets in the daytime. Thousands of poultry doing their part <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and the people were throwing it out of the window Every. In the early morning, it was kind of dangerous. <laughs> Walk in the streets. Because after people got up, they emptied their chamber pots through the window into the street. <laughs> and they were told to give a short warning before. So they were kind of fear. 
But seconds later, it happened. <laughs> and it's kind of tricky, too. Because when somebody shouts down, people in the street look up. <laughs> <laughs> And it was all in the streets, all that dirt and crap. Just one idea to get rid of it. They used to have a gutter in the street. Twice a week, every one had to sweep the dirt laying in front of his house into that gutter. Then they hoped for next rain to come and wash it downhill in the moat or in the valley. But that was more a hope than a good idea. It didn't really work. In July, August, when it was hot and dry, nothing went downhill. But it stank so horrible that all the rich people who could afford to have a solid house in the countryside went out of town. And because of all the dirt in the streets and the stored food in the houses, and you have to know, People had to store grain for a year to last, to be ready for a siege or a bad harvest. So there was a lot of storage in the attics and a lot of dirt in the streets. And that was most attractive for whom? Rats. There was an uncountable number of rats in a medieval city. Scientists say when you see one, there are 1,000 you don't see. They saw thousands. <laughs> and what happened because of the rats? Plague. Bubani got black plague. It was a special kind of flea, living on rats. The flea got this bacteria, killing all these millions of people. And it had started far from here, in Mongolia. And over the Silk Road, this disease made its way down to Russia. And when they were loading up ships in <coughs> Crimea with goods from the Silk Road, determined to go to Italy, these rats went on board as well. And a lot of these ships never arrived, because the whole crew died on the way. Ghost ships. But a few made it into an Italian harbor, like Messina in Sicily. And the rats went on land. And there it was. That's how the play came to Europe, on the ships of the merchants. Between 1347 and 1352, in just five years, almost half of Europe's population died. Average mortality in cities was 40%. On the countryside, oftentimes worse. There were areas also around Rodenburg where nobody survived. And the wolves came back into these empty villages, which fell back to nature, lost forever. And the hardest part was, for more than 90% of those who got the plague and died, there was no priest showing up to give them last rites, because the priests and the doctors were the first victims because they went close to these people, into their homes, to their beds, trying to cure them, them or help them in their last minutes. But it was contagious. And there weren't that many priests in the city. Pretty soon they were all gone. That meant for all the rest, no last rites. And that meant going where? <laughs> Hell. <laughs> Direct for eternity. And that was the real drama about this disease. Not to die, but like this. Knowing hell is next. This dimension of fear that these people had, we cannot imagine. Rational as we are nowadays about this kind of thing. And besides plague, there were other diseases, lots of wars and hunger. People could die from simple infections, like bad teeth. Life expectancy was low, childhood mortality high. Well, I could go on and on with that, but I don't want to make everything negative. 
There might have been also some positive aspects of life. But I don't know any. <laughs> <laughs> so my conclusion is, and I think you agree, there were no good old days. Right? Now, before we walk through this gate, I want to tell you something about it. It's one of the six gates of Rodenborg, and it was the safest one. No enemy tried to get up there. There's just a park and a cliff cover. We'll see that pretty soon once we get outside. Safest gate and the oldest one as well. It's from 1350. The gate, the tower, the whole construction. And there's something else special. Once we walk through, you will see that in the first big door coming up is a small door cut into the big one. They called it a manhole. <laughs> and they called it so because when the gatekeepers opened it, the hole was just big enough for one man to fit through. That's why men makes sense, doesn't it? It was in every city on every gate, always for the same use. It was for residents who made a certain kind of mistake. Guess which? Oh, uh, no. Too late was right. <laughs> Out too late. Missing curfew. Maybe because uh, you know. it was last chance for latecomers getting in. You know, it was too dangerous to open a big gate at night. Why should a whole city get in danger for a latecomer? The danger was an enemy could have tried to get in in the same moment when the big gate was open. And it didn't need a lot of enemy to destroy a city. A few of them were enough. The only thing they had to do was to start a, fire. start a fire, burn it down. There was a permanent threat. People had to think about security all the time. And sure they did. Every evening, with the beginning of darkness, that means different in the seasons, all the bells were rung from all the clock towers to inform everyone who was still outside to get back in. The bells gave the signal. People knew when it was time okay, <laughs> to hurry home. They had an hour to make it. If they missed it, they had a problem. Because all the big gates were shut for security reasons. Last chance then getting in was the manhole. But it was expensive to use it. The gatekeepers asked for a fine. Because without a fine, everybody would have been late. <laughs> Every five minutes, people would have knocked at their door all night through. But once it's expensive, it's different. The fine educated people to be home in time. Next time. And one more little thing. The ringing of the bells, it also was for the shepherds who were out with the animals all day. All the bigger animals were brought out of town in the morning on the meadows outside and brought back in the evening. And there was a schedule. It was organized. Otherwise, it would have been completely chaotic. First, the sheep and the goats came back. A quarter hour later, the pigs. And after another short break, the cattle. And they were just brought to that open door. And then they let them run. <laughs> they were all stampeding through the city streets, to their homes and stables, alone. Because they knew the way. <laughs> I wish I had seen that thing live. <laughs> and that was the long story of this small man. 
<laughs> now let's go and have a look at it. And now, look over there. Isn't that a fantastic view? It's only in that time of the year and in this time of the evening that the late sun lights up the city, the part of the city there. It's the southern end of Rodenburg, by the way. When you look down, you can see that we're on the edge of a cliff. It's going down like 60 yards. And we have this cliff on three sides around the city. No enemy tried to get up there. Only by one side. There was a chance for an attack. And that's where the high wall is with the ramparts. There all the people were standing on a high position on the wall, shooting down on all this enemy. Our main enemy were the neighbor cities, the Bishop of Würzburg and the Count of Nuremberg, to mention just the worst two. Because <laughs> they tried it so often, but they never made it. This city wasn't taken until the Thirty Years' War, which lasts from 1618 to 1648. And this one, detail you should know. We got the city rights 1274 and Rodenburg was conquered first time in 1631. Not bad. <laughs> but then it happened in only three days and it was changing everything. The one who did it was General Tilly, leader of the Imperial Catholic Army. And you have to know, Rodenburg was Protestant since 1544. You know what Protestant really means? <laughs> Luther was protesting against the practice of the church to sell letters of indulgence. And his followers were Protestants, because they also did that. And he only wanted to reform the church, but he divided it. That was not his plan, but that caused the Thirty Years' War hundred years later, which was a religious war for the first half of it. Later, they forgot what he started. And it was just for power and land and the normal stuff. <laughs> and this General Tilly, before he came to Rodenburg in 1631, he went to Magdeburg. It's a big Protestant town in the east of Germany. I mean, it was. And it was under siege by his troops, and they should convert back to Catholicism, and they refused. And then he killed 20,000 of the 25,000 who lived there. It was the most horrible massacre in that whole war. And then he moved from there to here. Rodenburg was also Protestant. And they had another plan. These troops needed a winter quarter because it was raining like crazy for a whole week. All the streets were mud. They made no miles anymore with their hundreds of carriages and wagons and cannons. So they needed a, a, a dry spot, a winter quarter. And they picked us. And we should let them in. But the only thing they wanted was plunder and steal. Take all our goods and things, our wives and daughters, and our belief. And we didn't want that. And there were brave people here. So the senators of Rodenburg decided it's better to stand up and fight and hold the city. And we dared to. And I have to tell you, that didn't work. <laughs> there were simply too many of them. And as weak as they were, they got these big cannons, 
Once they realize that we won't let them in, we were shooting from a distance against our walls. And we were shooting back on them once they were close enough. But on the third day of the attack, we ran out of gunpowder. There were just a few barrels of gunpowder left, all stored in the powder tower, which was one of these towers along the wall, a part of the fortifications, and a pitch dark room inside, like towers usually are. And then something very stupid happened. It's hard to talk about. <laughs> One of our own people made this huge mistake. It was one of the defenders. He was told to go and check out how much gunpowder we still had. <coughs> and he did that. But with a torch <laughs> oh, no. Maybe because it was so dark. <laughs> or maybe for forgot for a moment what kind of tower it was. <laughs> you know, later on, we couldn't ask him what the hell he <laughs> But the result was impressive. <laughs> he blew it up. There were some heavy explosions, a gap in the wall, right where the main attack was. Now we surrendered immediately. Hoping for mercy, we opened the gates and they came in. But there was no mercy. We had killed more than 300 of them during the attack, while we had lost just two people so far. One was the guy with the torch, <laughs> and the other one was standing too close. <laughs> a craftsman and a nobleman died in this situation. And then these troops were here for three months not only in the city, also out in the villages, killing hundreds of our people, bringing diseases in, including the plague. Rodenburg was plundered, but they didn't burn it left. After three months, they went, and Rodenburg still stood, because we paid a huge ransom to get rid of them, and they wouldn't burn the city down. It, it worked in that case here. <coughs> so we still had our city. But the war continued another terrible 70 years. And I don't want to go into details. Just say one thing. The longer that war lasts, the less you could tell who is friend or enemy. Towards the end of that war, they were just bandits and marauders, trying to plunder and steal as much as they could. And they did. Rodenburg suffered so badly that when this war was finally over, this was a poor, forgotten place. We had lost more than half of our people within the city walls and two-thirds in our villages, and we never came back. For the next 250 years, nothing happened. People had no money to modernize this city, and that's the only reason why it's so well preserved. It was preserved by poverty. And the wealth of today bases on poverty of yesterday. We just had to wait long enough <laughs> until tourism started. <laughs> it took forever. <laughs> and we didn't know it's coming. <laughs> but then, finally, 1890, there were some famous painters and poets showing up here. And they loved this place. And they talked about it to newspapers and magazines. Things were published and people started coming. Tourism began around 1900. It was a slow start. But nowadays, Rodenburg is world famous and rich again, like it was long ago. Showing between, there was a long break <laughs> when nothing happened at all. But here we are again. Back on the map, <laughs> with your support. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> One is, how many people live here? Answer is 2,500 in the old city. Out of 11,000 total. So the big majority lives outside in modern houses and not inside the city. And what's the oldest house? 
He blasts that all the time. It's in a parallel street, which is under construction. That's why we cannot walk there. But you can access it from the other side. It's from 908. But just the foundations in the cellar are like that old. The upper and visible part is from 1550, which is nothing special. <laughs> but it has special names. Outside it's written in German language that this is hell. <coughs> it's named hell. But it's a nice place. Because it's a carbon restaurant and it's open late. So when you people walk around in our city streets and there's somebody showing up telling you Oh, no. oh. <laughs> it's a good recommendation. <laughs> I guess only here. Yeah. But here it's true. And now the last story. It's about recent history, about times of World War II. <coughs> I think most of you don't know that Rodenburg was bombed by the American army in March 45. And it was destroyed by 40 Within the old walls, it happened for a special reason. A few weeks earlier, Nuremberg was bombed and mostly destroyed. It's a big city, 50 miles south. And there was a German general who left better Nuremberg, escaping into Rundberg with all his Nazi soldiers. in order to hold this city to the last man. You know, the Nazis loved Rome. For them, it was a symbol for a German city. But the front line of the American army was very close, just a few miles north of here. And they found out what's going on, that all these troops were in, and what kind of order was given. And so it happened. On the 31st of March, 1945, there were 16 military aircraft, so-called marauders, flying above Rodenberg, dropping these bombs down, which destroyed eastern and northern part of the old city. Thank God it was a foggy day. The pilots up there in the sky, they couldn't see a lot. So they didn't hit the city center. Like where we went around on the tour tonight, for instance, there was no damage. But the next plan was to destroy the rest of Rodenburg by artillery. General Devers of the American Army was preparing them. And he was nearby in the village with his men. And they were ready to go. And that would have been it. The city wouldn't be here. And you wouldn't be here and I. But somebody got in between and stopped them. It was an American. His name was John J. McClaw. He was Deputy Secretary of Defense. And he knew about the beauty of Rodenburg. He knew it's a medieval city. And he kind of liked it. But he never had been here before. You know who was here? His mom. As a tourist. In 1914, her name was Anne May. She took a painting of Rodenburg back home. It was on the walls of his parents' home in New York. He grew up with that painting. And he loved the stories his mother told him about this walled city. He was so fascinated as a boy that he never forgot all this for his whole life. And then much later, as an adult, he was in charge. And when he heard about this news, that Rodenburg should be totally destroyed by artillery, he called this general and he said, listen, Devers will not destroy Rodenburg if they surrender. It's a medieval city, <coughs> let's give them an option. And so it happened. Because he got involved in the right moment. We got this kind of choice. And the best of all was, when this news was coming in about this option, the German general was not in town. 
Perfect time. <laughs> he had forbidden any negotiations, like Hitler had forbidden it to all of his generals, even at the end of the war. But as this guy had left the city for a few days, he had installed a substitute commander, whose head was Major Terminus. And this guy was smart enough to understand that the war was almost over and surely lost for Germany. And he was brave enough to tell his men that he will hand the city over. And sure, that was treason. He would have been shot immediately. He took a high risk, but he went out of the city down in the valley. And down there is, and you maybe have seen it when we were standing at the edge, a stone bridge above the creek down in the bed. And on that bridge was a military vehicle of the American army with a white flag on top and two American officers inside waiting for an answer. Yes or no? Or no reaction at all? Which was more no? So there were two options. And this German major chose the right one. He went down to them and he said, it's your city. I hand it over. I'll be gone in a <coughs> month with all my men. I guarantee you. And so it happened. The German troops <coughs> went out of town. The American army occupied it the next day. Five weeks later, on the 8th of May, the war was over in Europe, and we still <coughs> had our city. We lost a part of it, but not the heart of it. <laughs> because of this too, an American and a German, they both saved Rodenburg from total destruction. Mm. Then the war was over. And by the way, nothing happened to that German major after the war. And John J. McCloy came to Rodenburg in 1948 to be awarded a citizen of all. But we still had a problem. There was no money to reconstruct the destroyed part of the city. We lost that war. There was no money at all. But people here had a good idea. And you know, that's what you should have when you don't have any money. <laughs> a good idea. By the way, that's how I became a night watchman. <laughs> well, this idea was asking the whole world for help. There was an article written by our tourist friends. It was sent to every bigger newspaper world. In this article, we said, please, you people out there who are friends of Rodenburg Journal, the only thing we need right now is Money. Money. <laughs> and we said, please help us send money in. And if you do it, it's a certain amount. We'll put your name on our wall. We offered that one could buy a meter of our wall symbol and have his name there. That's what you see when you walk on the ramp. Have you done that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you see it. There are hundreds of names on stone planks from all parts of the world. First, the name of the person and his city or country, and then how many meters one ball. It started with 80 marks in the mid 50s. Now it's like 1,200 euros. Well, 60 years of inflation. <laughs> Explain. And you shouldn't miss walking around. It's a high, open night and day, free of charge. And that's a safe little town. There's no crime at all. So if you people cannot sleep tonight for any reason, you better walk the wall <laughs> <laughs> or go to hell. Since we are back where we started an hour ago, this was the Night Watchman tour. I hope you liked it. And last thing you should do before you leave, was to put the money in the hand. You realize this thing, you like to send